Welcome to Rooted Intentionally. I'm Susan Carson, and it's my passion to create safe space for transformational encounters through listening, healing prayer, and spiritual practices. And in this series of Zoom casts, we're bringing you casual conversations and spiritual practices designed to help you live more deeply rooted in the love of God. And today we're beginning a new series of conversations and practices around healing our image of God. And I am super excited for you guys to meet my friends, Dave and Beth Borum. Welcome, you guys. Hi, Susan. So glad you're here. Dave and Beth are founders and directors of Fall Creek Abbey, an urban retreat center in Indianapolis, Indiana, that oozes the peace and love and nurture of God. I speak from personal experience. It's one of my favorite places on the planet, and you all can't let go now because I still need to be able to go, but you should go, so I'll just say that. Um, David, are, you are. Overdue. <laughs> I am so overdue. Is ready for you. Ready. Um, thank you. COVID is stupid. I'll just say that, <laughs> and then we'll move on. But I can't wait to go back and visit you guys. Um, you guys are also authors of a award-winning, shall we say, book that I love. When faith becomes site co-authors opening your eyes to god's presence all around you beth you've offered some authored some other books as well anything else folks should know about you you want folks to know about you well it might be helpful just to know a little bit about our personal life we have been yeah. for almost 42 years we were 14 when we got married. <laughs> Not, <laughs> of course. <laughs> you know, we have four adult kids who live a bike ride away here in Indy. Mm. And then we have six beautiful grandchildren. So we like for people to know that because that's a very big part of life for us. Very important um, for us. Well, it is because, you know, a lot of times we think of vocation as what we do or how we make our living or our job, but vocation is so much larger than that. And I've just been sitting with that again, that our kids and how we grandparent and how we play together and how we take care of our property and how we neighbor with one another is it's kind of all of our vocation. So we Americans are kind of work um, obsessed. Work centric instead of love centric or relationship. Mm. Oh. Yeah, so good. It's mm -hmm. so good. It's a much bigger view of our lives and our being and our mm -hmm. reason for being on this planet, right, for the time yeah. that we are. Um, I know, too, that we're both spiritual directors, and yeah. I'm thinking that your folks might know a little bit about spiritual direction. And then we offer a training for people who are interested in learning how to offer spiritual direction. And that's a real central piece to what we do at Fall Creek Abbey. Mm -hmm. Yes, you all have a school of spiritual direction there. So mm -hmm. for folks interested in maybe stepping into that world, mm -hmm. connecting with you is a great step. So yeah, love that. Thanks. I'm so glad you guys are here. So the first question I ask every guest because uh, we're all about living rooted right here. Yes, you're wonderful. What's, thanks. What's been helping you guys stay rooted in this long, crazy season we've been living through? Mm. I'll go first. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. It was a great question. I even appreciated being asked that question yeah. again in this way. Um, at the beginning of the year, end of the year, beginning of the year, I worked through kind of a reflection, um, and I'm going to call it a priority setting uh, process. I don't like the word goals anymore. It just doesn't suit me well. So priorities yeah. just has, is a little more spacious for me. Mm -hmm. But as a result of that, this process, uh, what, what I ended up with were four uh, to-do goals for 2021 mm -hmm. and four to-be goals for 2021. Oh, I love that. 
And um, yeah, the process was good, what came out of it. And then I kind of laminated it to a little bookmark and it's sitting over there. I can see it right now. So I don't mm-hmm. forget this, but that actually has been very grounding for me to review that, to live into that again and again. Um, I, I think oftentimes we're both, I'm 65, she's almost 65. You can almost feel like by this time of life, you, you need to give up kind of planning and to-do lists and goals and just kind of, you're free from all that. But I'm finding that it's really important at this juncture in life to stay rooted in those to do and to be goals that are still meaningful and important and significant to me and what's on God's heart for my life. So I think that that little process has helped me to stay grounded in the midst of it. I had an insight two nights ago. One of my to-do goals was to refinish our basement. We have a 110-year-old home with one of these it's not as creepy as some basements, but it's 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 dark and grungy. And um, so I have an art studio down there. And I one of my goals was to refinish the basement. And I'm not, I can do a lot of things, but I'm not like Mr. Handyman. So I have found that the physical work on my home has been grounding. And that's been a surprise to me. I mean, we've we've seen that exercise and getting out is really important during the winter months in general yeah. with COVID, it's doubly so. Yeah. But two days ago, it's like, I think I'm more grounded because I have been physically tackling some things I've never done before. I'm problem solving with nail guns and uh, air compressors and doing, <laughs> and I think that's been grounding. Yeah. The challenge of that has yeah. been really grounding for me. Mm-hmm. I would not have thought of that. Who would have thought? Yeah. Who would have thought? That's beautiful. Mm. Beth, how about you? Yeah. So, like most people, a year ago, when we were in lockdown, for the next few months, I felt somewhat discombobulated inside. Yes. And, uh, you know, I just kind of named named it or blamed it on the, the pandemic and the lockdown and disorientation of what had been normal. But over the summer, David and I began to do a lot of reading around the topic of neuroscience. And one of the things that I was introduced to through the work of Life Model Works and Jim Wilder is an exercise called Interactive Gratitude. And essentially it's this practice kind of a encouraged to be a daily practice where you identify something you feel currently grateful for. I mean, it could be in the past, but when you recall it, it, it fills your heart. You feel that kind of sense of joy and gratitude and a goodness, you know, yeah. not something that's just perfunctory. Like I'm thankful today for. Cause you're supposed for, to be. Thankful yeah. For. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you truly, like you truly feel this gratitude. So like this morning I was reflecting on um, last night, we had our son and daughter-in-law and, and three grandkids over for dinner. We hadn't seen them and spent much time with them for a while. They've been super busy. And there was a moment around our gas table, um, outdoor fire table that you've, you've seen before, Susan, uh, where we were talking and my son was sharing a bit about where he is right now and what's going on for him. And I took him in and I just felt that kind of <laughs> that motherly, he is so amazing. What, <laughs> what, a, what a wonderful young man. I felt this deep gratitude for my son. And so this morning I revisited that. And so I felt the gratitude. I allowed myself to experience it where I felt it in my body, what emotions it, it brought up for me. I wrote, wrote it down. And then the interactive part is to imagine God joining you as you feel this gratitude and how, what is God's response? And so then I wrote out 
a sense of just in a kind of stream of consciousness, how I imagined God responding to me and my joy and gratitude for our son. So I've been practicing that since July. And one of the things that I think it has affected is something called um, our default emotional state. You know, all of us have kind of an uh, operating mode emotionally that we function in. Sometimes it's just kind of at midline happy and joyful, but not necessarily sad or glum. I would say that I operate most of the time a little below that. Um, I can be a little melancholy, a little blue. And I certainly was with the pandemic. But I think what has really happened for me is that this has raised the level of my default emotional state. Wow. I feel more grounded and rooted in joy. Gratitude in the goodness of God and the goodness of life. And I can see a difference. Now, it's mm-hmm. not like it's not the magic pill, but it is sure. definitely, well, what it's doing is it's rewiring my brain, <clears throat> helping me to experience a more secure attachment, constant sense of the love and presence of God. And that has been super grounding for me and uh, really. Mm. really thrilled oh, uh, I love that as a four who can tend to be a bit melancholy I feel like this is a practice that might help me <laughs> yes well <laughs> yes. I go to the four and sometimes in health and sometimes not in health so I kind of do that with you yes yeah. I'm I am gonna try this this is this is amazing and, and it actually creates maybe an interesting bridge to this whole idea of our image of God, because as you're describing bringing God into that gratitude, how you view God mm-hmm. certainly would have a, a big impact on how you would experience that practice, I would think. So I would love to hear you guys just talk a little bit about why our image of God matters and how it does impact our spiritual journey with him. Yeah, I I think that by and large, we don't really think about this question. It's an unconscious question. I mean, we may talk a lot about God. We may talk a lot about theology. So we may mouth a lot of words, but we rarely uh, notice how our thoughts about God affect much of what we experience, feel, do, think about. And so I think it matters because it has a almost like a controlling influence over us, but is largely unacknowledged. Mm-hmm. And it, it makes all the difference in the world. Mm-hmm. There's almost nothing as important to surfacing that and wrestling with the question is director. She has a phrase that at first I kind of bristled at, but she would say the God of your understanding. Mm. And she did not mean it in a pluralistic, anything goes, anything you believe sort of way. Whatever God you believe in is cool. It's not that kind of thing. It's a. But we always have a God image of our current understanding that is influencing, coloring, dictating, yes. inviting, uh, you name it, uh, the shape of our relationship mm. with that God of our understanding. Yeah, so how we perceive God consciously or unconsciously will affect the degree to which we want to cozy up to that God, right? Yeah, absolutely. How comfortable we, want to, we are to draw near. But we also uh, have found it really important to um, realize that it's not just how we think about God, but how we imagine God thinking and feeling about God us that is also extremely Mm -hmm. important Mm -hmm. a friend of ours named dana russo 
uh, once said um, when we were together in a meeting, you know, our theology is how we think about God. But how we imagine God thinking and feeling about us is the relationship. Mm-hmm. And um, so part of the journey of, of understanding our God image is just being coming conscious of how we think about God and how we imagine God thinks about us. And, and maybe it's important to name, you can talk about this a little bit, that how we think about God uh, is based on our projection of who we imagine God to be, okay. how we imagine God to be toward us. Okay. A bit about projection. <laughs> <laughs> What if I don't? Well, you don't, then okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> no, I don't know if this term, you know, is meaningful to people, but I think oftentimes we think that what we know is, in fact, is reality, is like, same. yeah, one and the same. But we, I mean, it's the way we know things is we are always projecting what's inside of us onto the screen of the world on relationships. It's how we make sense of things and test things out. It's a bit of that feedback loop. We project, we get feedback. Is this accurate? We do that with God also. We project what's inside of us onto this. It's like the biggest screen imaginable. Mm -hmm. And we project what's inside of us. And oftentimes we get a lot of feedback loops from our communities who tell us, well, God is pleased with you when you obey. God is angry and upset with you and distant from you and turns God's back on you when you. And so our communities reinforce this projection and it can be un, it can be hard to untangle that and to say, are my projections really, in fact, who God is toward me and how God is? To- mm-hmm. Sets up a, a kind of a, a scary, lonely, unfamiliar journey to test our projections. Mm. And those feedback loops, by the way, are not not just the things that we hear our community saying to us. You know, they're, they're, um, they're, you know, stated theology. It's the unstated theology of how they relate to us, especially maybe authority figures. You know, it can be your, in your family of origin, parents, and how they image God to us. And then as we are on a faith journey and part of faith communities and those people in those faith communities and how they relate to us, begin to be, we, we pull information from those experiences of how they react to us or respond to us based on whether we're at our best or not at our best. And then we start to project those things onto God. God must be like that too. God must be like my stern father who is demanding and exacting and punishing uh, when I don't live up to his standards. Yes. Yeah, it sets up a very transactional kind of view of God, like his, the way he's feeling about me, responding to me is based on my behavior. That's right. um, and it's not relational in that sense. It becomes very transactional. Mm-hmm. And so I wonder as you sit with so many people and hear this in their stories, and as we observe it in our own stories, how can we begin to be aware, right, of this thing that is we're largely unaware of? Like, how do we begin to raise our awareness of how this really is, these things really are influencing our image of God, how we're seeing God and relating to him? Yeah. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. The first thing that comes to my mind is noticing our emotional journey more, paying attention to uh, when we feel shame, when we feel like uh, I'm never measuring up and I'm always behind. And, you know, I think we are 
predisposed to think that those are just normal experiences of life. And they are, mm-hmm. but um, I think that our kind of what happens in our heart and mind often exacerbates those. So I think particularly shame, guilt, and fear of not just blasting over or papering over those emotions, but sitting and saying, where is that coming from? Yeah. And often we will hear kind of this imagined this God <laughs> reinforcing those feelings. And we're going to lead a little mm-hmm. exercise that helps yeah. to maybe show what that would be like. But I think it starts with dialing into those emotions. Yeah. When we have those experiences of feeling that shame, guilt, fear, even anger, that we are hospitable to those emotions and we allow them to be important messengers, helping us to recognize how we're perceiving God. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I might add, and and I'll, I'll explain it this way. So I, you know, I have the frequent opportunity to sit with people and offer spiritual direction and, and, you know, with most people, including myself, we get into these ruts or these kind of looping experiences where we're kind of back to the same issue that we've seen like It's the song that never ends, you know, the thing that we keep dealing with again and again and again. And, you know, I will listen to a directee and hear the song coming up. Here they are again, dealing with this ruthless inner critic that is just dogging them. And oftentimes in the past, I've thought, okay, there is an issue with God image. There's a spiritual issue here that needs to be addressed. Maybe there's some kind of thing that needs untangled within them, some trauma, some something, not really sure what, but I often just thought of it as a spiritual issue that needs some healing. And as I uh, mentioned earlier, when I was talking about the interactive gratitude and neuroscience, I'm beginning to wonder if some of our places where we get stuck are not as much about spiritual issues as they are neurological issues. So issues actually with the wiring of our brain. Mm. By that, I mean that we are wired for relationship, but because of our experience, our experiencing of the the failure of human love, it becomes um, weakly attached. And so there's this concept within neuroscience called attachment, and it's basically how we bond with another in relationship. And there's two kinds. There's secure attachment, which is the sense that I am loved no matter what. And I know that, and I know that I can come to this relationship and be whoever I am, wherever I am, and I will still experience love. Well, most of us did not grow up, (laughs) even my own children didn't grow up with that kind of secure experience. I mean, largely, yes, but there were certainly times when it was intermittent. So there's secure attachment and then there's insecure attachment. It's where we have learned that we have to play a game in order to earn somebody's love. We've got to perform well. We've got to fly under the radar We've got to be a good little girl who doesn't ask for too much. And so we develop these patterns of relating in order to strengthen uh, attachment through basically some kind of performance. And so what I'm discovering is that whatever attachment style we learned and experienced in our family of origin and childhood, we bring that same attachment style into adult life. And it's how we relate to everybody including God. So however I have learned to relate based on how I was related to, I'm going to, I'm going to react the same way in relation to God. So if I have an insecure attachment with God, I will constantly be wondering, okay, what is it that God wants to get from me or get out of me in order for me to be loved and and accepted by God? Wow. That's uh, so significant in terms, uh, in so many ways, but I think about how we began to help ourselves and other people 
re-image God, right? Which is a re-imaging of ourselves. They're so connected yeah. and it seems like it's in, so deeply embedded in our souls and neuroscience would tell us even in our brains, how do we begin to help ourselves and other people re-image God? Yeah. Susan, another thought that comes to mind. Yeah. Um, I notice as I sit with folks in spiritual direction, how hard people are on themselves. Yeah. I think perfectionism is just this theme that runs through all of our lives. And some people it's stronger in, but it's that, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just always failing. And uh, I think coupled with that then, is examining our understanding of transformation. Mm -hmm. I think we, we all know that we have some work to do. I think we have been trained and taught that if you try harder, if you know more, if you you know activate the will if you had sufficient willpower then you could wrestle your your life would look more like this ideal of perfection that you are are living under and um i just noticed that it comes up again and again and again in different mm -hmm. forms and um what i'm finding is encouragement from another human mm -hmm is in such short supply of most of us. Most people are doing better than they think they're doing. They're better parents than they think they are. They're better at managing their life and the challenges. They're better at loving people. But they live under this kind of message is I'm not, I'm not doing it right or I'm not doing it well enough. And so I think part of how we change is to help one another see the way we change is not by willpower and kind of bullying and pressuring and, and submitting, you know, uh, subordinating people into right behavior and right living. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's encouraging. It's, 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 mm -hmm. it's really saying you're doing well. Yes. Hear that. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That begins to unleash, I think, transformation in a far more powerful way over the long haul. It's from the center out. Mm. Think about how powerful then it would be if our image of God is one of like God is our best cheerleader who's saying, add a girl, add a boy, you know, like you are really putting your best foot forward. I'm proud of you. Mm. Instead of this God who's always like taking notes on all of our foibles and kind of measuring life and saying, hey, you're just not quite there yet, you know, just always a bit disappointed. Yes. There's nothing that discourages and undermines um, transformation and healing mm -hmm. than having this idea that God is always disappointed with us rather than God. Mm -hmm celebrating the small victories and supporting us where we're still having a hard time um, being willing to be with us in those hard times without mm -hmm. judgment and shame and mm -hmm. you know. yes yeah i mean i i see that as i sit with people it's not that we're not all trying like everybody's <laughs> trying really hard <laughs> and yet that that trying at some point works against us, right? Because it works against the, the resting and just knowing and experiencing the love of a God who is for us, right? And cheering us on. And it's, it's a very different picture and experience of God, but it shifts, it begins to shift everything yeah. in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to give people space and time with you all to actually experience this. For, for me, one of the things that's been helpful for me are spiritual practices, right? Finding practices that open space to begin to experience God differently um, than I have in the past. Um, 
but I wonder before we move into that practice, is there anything else that feels important to you guys to share on this topic? And if not, we'll just go right to the practice. Nothing's coming up for me. Yeah, what about you? I will say it this way. <laughs> um, the Bible can be a great blessing and it can be part of the problem the way we read the Bible. What? <laughs> <laughs> And we are going to get a lot of things wrong in life. Can we just, can we yes. just yes. make that our expectation? But I, I, I'm kind of simple with this. Either I'm going to err on the side of my God image being a loving, all compassionate, yeah. embracing. Accepting. Accepting. Persistent. Being person. Or I'm going to err on the side that God is stingy, exacting, mm. uh, never satisfied, um, confusing. Mm. And so I think we can almost decide, like, well, if I'm going to get a lot of things wrong, which of those sounds better to me? Um. <laughs> Which sounds more life-giving? Which will actually uh, make the greatest difference in me becoming the kind of person that I believe God wants me to become? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for raising that because what I've found in my experience, which is not certainly indicative necessarily of anybody else's, but as my image of God has shifted and healed over time, as I read scripture, all of a sudden, I'm aware that I see verses that I thought all this time meant one thing and all of a sudden I read it and I'm like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. this means something completely different that I've never seen here before. Um, so that shift in how we misunderstand and understand scripture, mm -hmm. I think is a, is a big deal. Yes. Yeah. yes. So thank you for that. All right, let's move into this practice. I'm always excited for these because I get to just I get to just be a part of them as you lead us. Settle right in mm -hmm. and participate. Yes, so, totally. Yeah, just a little instruction for um, those who are listening. So this is going to be a journaling exercise. So you want to make sure you have a pen or pencil and a journal or paper to write on. And then it's a journaling exercise that may require some time. So what I would suggest is we'll give a little pause, but it may not be sufficient. So you can hit the pause button and take as much time as you need uh, for each of the journaling prompts. And uh, then, yeah, just sit with it for however much time you need. Okay. All right, so we would describe this exercise as an exercise helping us become aware of a distorted image of God. How we become aware of a distorted image of God. So as we begin this exercise, um, it's always important to become present to both ourselves and to God to actually enter into the present moment as fully as we possibly can. And we found that the best way to do that is to get into our bodies. Because once we become uh, in touch with our body and our breath, we simultaneously become open to the presence of God in this present moment. So as you begin, I encourage you to begin to notice your body and even locate yourself in your body. You are an embodied person, contained. Feel the weight of your body being held by the chair or sofa or floor upon which you're sitting. And 
Maybe even do a gentle scan of your body, noticing, perceiving where there is pain or tightness or discomfort, just noticing how your body feels. Now I would encourage you to attach to your breath. Place your attention on your inhales and exhales. Taking some really deep, full breaths. And then very slowly, maybe a count of five, exhale. Letting all of the air out. Do that maybe three times. Now from this embodied and centered place, solidly settled within the present moment, I want you to think back over the last few days, or maybe a few weeks, and identify a time when you were at your best, when you felt really good about yourself, about what you were doing, about how you were being in that moment, even if it was just a brief moment, a time when you were at your best. Once you identify that time, that memory, I encourage you to inhabit it. To notice the feelings that you felt and that you're feeling now as you remember this experience of being at your best. What were you feeling? Where did you feel it in your body? What is aroused in you as you remember this experience? Now I want you to imagine God experiencing you in this moment. Imagine God experiencing you in this moment of being at your best. How does God seem toward you? Does this God seem like a loving companion? Do you feel confident with this God? Do you feel like you can be human and vulnerable with this God?
Do you feel seen by God, felt by God, and safe with this God? Take a moment and write down a thorough description using as specific words as possible to portray the image of God that comes to mind, who is experiencing you at your best. I'd like to invite you to continue to stay in your body. Maybe as we make this move, take a few deep breaths again, return to your body and even leave this memory that you've just had where it, where it is. As you come to this space and this time, Go back over the memory of the last several days. Become aware of, a, of an experience, a time when you, are, you were not at your best. Where you stumbled, where you fell. Where you, in reflection, have some sense of I could have done better. As you inhabit the memory of not being at your best, just notice what feelings are attached to that that surface you remember that experience? How did you feel then? How do you feel now? And how do you imagine God experiencing you in that moment? How is God toward you as you remember not being at your best? How does God seem toward you? This God Does this God make you feel ashamed at even being human? Does this God make you feel like you're not good enough? Does this God even seem hard to trust? Capricious, undependable. Take a moment now and write down in your journal or a piece of paper any descriptions, specific words that portray this image of God.
take a moment and compare the two images, the two descriptions you've written down side by side. Compare the description of how God, how you experienced God toward you when you were at your best and not at your best. Are they the same? Are they similar? Notice what you notice of the words that are the same or contrasting. How did your sense of being at your best or not being at your best affect the way you experienced God experiencing you? One of the most important questions you can ever be asked. How do you experience God experiencing you? What might that explain to you about your image of God, the God of your current and your own projections onto God that might not be who God truly is? Feel free to take whatever time you need to respond to those reflection questions. You can hit the pause on the recording and sit with them for a while. What we've introduced you to is a way of becoming aware of our distorted images of God. And based on how we perceive our performance and how it's perceived by God. It is the first and it's a really important step in healing our God image. But actually healing that image and even replacing it with an image of who God truly is, a projection that is proximate to who, who God is, is a process certainly not accomplished in a single spiritual practice or exercise like what we just led. But may we encourage you right here and right now, wherever you are, spend time praying with God about whatever has come up for you. Acknowledging any of the maybe surprising or distorted ways that you often see God, and then asking God for divine help in healing your God image. I want to end with a scripture from 2 Corinthians 4, 6, where Paul says, For God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts, so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. I think Paul is encouraging us to trust the light that is within us. To trust that we actually have what it takes to be able to know and recognize the true God who God really is, what God is. And finally, Paul suggests that we look deeply into the face of Jesus for the answer. Amen. 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 Amen was powerful and really helpful. And 
I just echo those words. It's a like all of our life in God, right? It's a journey, it's a process, and it unfolds over time. And yet Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Mm -hmm. So as we gaze on Jesus, we begin to get a clearer, better picture of who God is. So thank you for that invitation into that today. Thank you so much you guys for being with us. This has been deep and amazing. Um, I wonder if people want to find you, connect with you, Fall Creek Abbey, all of that. What's the, what are the best ways for them to do that? I would say just look us up, uh, fallcreekabbey.org, and you can fill out a contact form and reach out to us with any questions you have, or if you want to come for a visit, we'd love to have you. Absolutely. I promise you'll love it. Um, and I just want to mention again, not because you asked me to, but there is a chapter in this beautiful book on this subject. So I'd really encourage people to hit Amazon um, mm -hmm. when faith becomes sight. Mm -hmm. So I hope this time has been meaningful for you today as it has been for me. And if it has been, would you do all the things? Would you like, subscribe, share this so that others can find and join this rooted community? Um, you can find my book, podcasts, some free devotionals, and some other stuff on my website. That's susancarson.net. I'd love to connect with you on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, even come and speak in an event or be your coach. It would be a joy to journey with you. So we bless you today to live deeply rooted in the love of God. Mm -hmm.